conference co-hosted by the Folger Farm to Table Project and the Newberry Center for Renaissance Studies, sponsored by the Mellon Foundation. Today's panels will explore cross-cultural exchange, exoticism, inequality, and race. Our first panel, European Views on Indigenous American Foods, represents a reunion across three continents. It includes David Davide Dominici from Bologna, Alan Greco from Itati, and Gregorio Saldariaga from Universidad de Antigua. I will not be reading their bios today. They are available online. We're, we're doing this in order to save some time. Please note that audience members can use the Q&A function at the bottom of their screen to input their questions for the panelists today. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Davide, who will be our first speaker today. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Leah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Well, first, first of all, let me uh, thank uh, all the organizers of this wonderful conference. And uh, okay, without further delay, I'll go into my uh, my paper. Uh, you which can is put your video on as well, too, so we can see you, Davide. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the title of my presentation will be Mesoamerican Food Practices in an Early Modern Ethnographic Subgenre. Uh, when we study the food-related dimension of early modern colonial encounter in the Americas, we tackle a very diverse and complex corpus of 16th century sources, most of them written by European authors. Whether we are interested in understanding indigenous food practices or the perception that Western colonizers had of them, we must uh, scrutinize the cultural filters through which Europeans looked at indigenous customs. This is why the study of taxonomic categories, culinary analogies and translations, as well as of cultural stereotypes has a so important role. Even more important is the need to consider the political aims of European writers, often fostering a variety of specific interests or colonial projects. In the case of Mesoamerica, the personal interests of eyewitnesses, such as Hernán Cortés and his fellow soldiers, or the propagandistic needs of official chronicles and biographers, such as Gonzalo Fernández de Oviedo or Francisco López de Gómara, do act as the forming lenses that must necessarily become the very subject of our critical analysis. Next slide, please. Okay, thank you. Luckily, at least in the case of Mesoamerica, we can count on a series of texts, mostly put together by missionaries, such as Bernardino de Sagún, and the slide that you see is the page of his Codex Florentino devoted to indigenous food, or Diego Duran, whose creation was actually the product of collective and collaborative efforts where native persons had an important role, providing us with views equally shaped by their own interests, but at the very least, less tainted by European-derived cultural stereotypes. Next, next slide, please. Nevertheless, if we are interested in scrutinizing the early modern European views on indigenous foodways, we must keep in mind that most of these missionary polyphonic sources remained in a manuscript form, enjoying a very restricted circulation at least until the 19th century when they were rediscovered and published. On the other hand, the early modern common European perception of indigenous foodways was mainly shaped by texts that became books that is the very subject of our discussion today, and often real best-selling ones, soon translated in many languages so that their impact on early European public was enormous. This is the reason why we need to consider the publishing history and reception of those books, the ways in which the information they contain was transmitted from one book to another, and even the specific literary genres they pertain to, since a literary genre provides in itself fundamental epistemological coordinates, which deeply influence and drive the reader's understandings. And to make an example, just think about the enormous influence that the complex publishing history of Theodore de Bries engravings, such as the one that you see, had on the European perception of indigenous American cannibalism, even much more than the narratives contained in the texts that those engravings were illustrating. Next slide, please. 
As an example of this kind of approach, I will briefly discuss here a small group of 16th century cognate Spanish and Italian texts where indigenous Mesoamerican food habits were systematically described. They include the last part of the Historia de la Conquista de Mexico by Francisco Lopez de Gomara, or better said, of its Italian translation published in Rome in 1555, as you see on the left, the Relazione of the so-called Anonymous Conqueror, published by Giovan Battista Ramusio in Italian in Venice in 1556, and the anonymous text titled Descrizione dell'India Occidentale, a small booklet probably published in Venice between 1564 and 1570. The mutual relationship linking these texts will be explored in order to investigate the ways in which a specific subgenre of ethnographic publications took shape in early modern Europe, where it enjoyed a wide diffusion and a high popularity. Next slide, please. A common characteristic shared by these three sources is that they include sections organized as series of paragraphs devoted to the description of native customs, some of them of a culinary kind, in a timeless fashion, detached from any narrative context and employing an atemporal present tense. In the slide, for example, you can see the table of contents of the last part of Gomara's work, where the historical narrative of the previous part gives way to such a non-narrative structure. And underlined, you see a chapter devoted to wine, for example. Next slide. On the left, you see the continuation of Gomara's table of contents with two other chapters underlined, one devoted to wheat and the other one to agave. Um, uh, while on the right, you see the structure of the text by the so-called anonymous conqueror. And again, you see this series of paragraphs and underline those related with uh, food information. Next slide, please. On the left, you see the structure of the Descrizione dell'India Occidentale, where again, you see this uh, series of paragraphs and those underlines, even if the title, speaking about shoes and money, do, do not, are not very clear, actually they speak about uh, food habits. On the right, you see the structure of Codex Vaticanus Latino 3738, the so-called ethnographic section, which, share, which shares the same structure. But since it does not contain food-related information, I, I will not consider it here, even if it's important to understand the relationship between these uh, texts. Next slide. Uh, I will only provide two examples of the genealogical chain linking this group of texts. Uh, in this slide, I put sections of text describing the use of cacao. And without going here into detail for lack of time, suffice to compare the underlined sections to see how often the texts not only share the same information, but even the very same terms and phrasing. For example, I'm sorry, they're in Italian, obviously, but uh, in the first uh, uh, phrase, you see that they're speaking about mandorle, almonds, and they, which they call cacanat. In, in the second phrase, again, you see the, the use of the same uh, uh, terms, uh, mandorle, uh, cacanatl, and in the last part of the phrase, you see that it says, a ciò che uh, si difendono dal vento dal sole, so that other trees can, can uh, protect them from wind and sun. And in the last phrase, which is from the Descrizione dell'India Occidentale, you see again that the Indians call uh, this fruit, uh, which resemble uh, an almond, and again, a choque, si defend del sole. So it is clear that these texts do not only share information, but actually they draw uh, specific phrasing uh, from uh, one another. Next slide, please. Here in the next, okay, here you have examples related with agave and octli. Octli is fermented wine beverage from agave, today best, better known as pulque. And again, Gomara says that they use their, the leaves as roof tiles, and if they cook it, it uh, becomes uh, honey or vinegar uh, or, or sugar, vinegar, and wine. And the same, exactly the same information is contained in the anonymous conqueror, saying that from it they made wine, vinegar, uh, honey, and we could say preserve. And he's speaking again about roof ties, etc. And the same thing happened in the Descrizione dell'India Occidentale with the same sequence of wine, uh, vinegar, honey, and preserve, and this mention of uh, roof tiles. Next slide, please. 
to give you an idea of the impact of this text, look at these excerpts from later works of John Chilton and Jose de Acosta, both of them of the last part of the 16th century, where you can find precisely the same sequence of terms uh, and even the very same phrasing. So it's, it's obvious that there is a, a genealogy chain of, of um, a genealogical chain linking this uh, text. Next slide. Uh, to study this uh, genealogical chain, we face a problem. We have two uh, hypotheses. The first one is this one that poses that it, it existed, a lost Spanish original of the Relazione, of the anonymous conqueror, used by Gomara for his Spanish tra text, translated into Italian in Rome, and then also the original Relazione, translated in Italian, published by the Ramuzio, and used by the anonymous author, uh, of the Descrizione, who also knew the Codex Vaticanus Latino but through the mediation of Venetian manuscript. The other hypothesis, next slide, which is the one I prefer, but it would be too complex now to explain why, posits that we actually there is no Spanish original of the Relazione de alcune cose della Nuova Spagna, that the main text is Gomara, and then that the Italian translation was used to, to create in Venice a fort. Uh, uh, relation for an account by a supposed conqueror and probably by the, the very same author uh, to write the description of the Lindia uh, Occidentale. Last slide and the concluding one. Uh, be it as it may, and leaving no to other occasion any attempt to solve this philological problem, what I want to stress in conclusion is that the group of cognate texts I briefly introduced today do constitute an early and significant example of the way in which bookish knowledge regarding indigenous Mesoamerican food was, was disseminated in early modern Europe. They are marked by a focus on very specific, I would almost say iconic indigenous foods such as cacao and agave wine, and above all, by the use of a non-narrative present tense, thus representing one of the earliest instances of the allochronic ethnographic present which became typical of anthropological literature in the following centuries. The invention of non-European communities crystallized in an out-of-time temporal limbo has been one of the main epistemological contributions that ethnography gave to Western colonialism. I think that the group of texts we have just discussed represents a revealing facet of this phenomenon, being a precocious manifestation of an early modern literary genre of food ethnographies. Thank you. Sorry for speaking one minute more than the time I had. Thank you, Davide. That was wonderful. Perfect way to open up this panel. Thank you. So now we welcome Alan. Yes, thank you, Leah. Uh, I'll just take five seconds to say, say thank you to everybody who's contributing to making this conference uh, such a wonderful experience. A lot of work behind the scenes or behind the screens, maybe I should be saying. Anyway, so my paper, as you know, the title is To Eat or Not to Eat an Iguana During Lent. So let me begin by saying that although my title might sound like that of a children's story by Dr. Seuss, I hope to show that the dilemma it refers to can also shed light on a bigger picture. The way in which foodstuffs and more generally nature were classified from the Middle Ages and until the early 17th century belonged to a framework that was not the exclusive preserve of natural philosophers since it was shared by much of contemporary society. It is therefore not surprising that this classification system determined the cultural and scientific ideas that newly arrived travelers and settlers in the Americas employed to understand the natural world surrounding them. In an environment where most of the foodstuffs were still foreign to them, the danger of eating like a native and thus becoming a native, as Rebecca Earl has shown, or worse still, doing irreparable harm by consuming unknown fare, were very real concerns. Such perils constituted a strong incentive to adhere to culturally ingrained explanatory schemes regarding the supposed properties of food. 
rooted in medieval and Renaissance thinking, the great chain of being and the doctrine of the four elements also made their way to the new world in the mental baggage of European explorers, travelers, and settlers. Both of these constructs left their distinctive imprint on the way an uncharted nature was perceived by these early observers, but also influenced their efforts to classify plants and animals previously unknown to them. Since the consumption of iguana is hardly common knowledge, let me point out that two different kinds of iguanas were and still are consumed. Could I have the first slide, please? The first and most widespread species found from Mexico to as far south as Brazil and Paraguay is the so-called green iguana, while the other species, next slide please, is the much smaller and distinctly rare lesser Antillian iguana, the so-called iguana delicatissima, whose binomial nomenclature even highlights a value judgment as to the taste of its meat. Next slide, please. The accounts of learned chroniclers and observers of the 16th century amply testify to the consumption of iguana meat, beginning with the influential writings of Peter Martyr Dangueira, who never actually set foot in the New World, but wrote no knowledgeably about it on the basis of reports from those who had been there. Peter Martyr furnishes one of the earliest sources mentioning iguana meat in 1511, although he may have mentioned it in an unpublished letter as early as November 1493. There's no time to discuss Peter Martyr's comments on the taste of this meat and its importance in official banquets among the natives where the Spanish were sometimes in attendance. Much of what he wrote prefigured the countless published and unpublished reports on iguana meat coming from a variety of French, Italian, Spanish, and English accounts throughout the 16th century. The reason for mentioning this continuity is that it clearly indicates how the European framework of seeing and categorizing new foods was common to all of these authors and caused them to react in much the same way when confronted with this exotic animal that allegedly ta uh, tasted like capon. How did the iguana fit into the conceptual frameworks that all Europeans had in mind when confronted with both old and new foodstuffs? The untold wealth of plants and animals in the Americas almost immediately posed the problem of fitting all of the new elements of the natural world into existing explanatory schemes. The issue was not, of course, a purely taxonomic one, since at the root there was more than just the need to name and identify, in that the European food system operated in a symbiotic relationship with a more general classification system known as the great chain of being, as I've already said. Many of the certitudes that had to come to rule over the cosmological representation and the created world, uh, next uh, slide please, were at the very least perturbed by the new discoveries in the realm of nature. In this slide you have schematically laid out, it's, it's a very schematic, as I say, uh, rendition, um, the hierarchical order of the elements and some of the living organisms linked to them. But the iguana and its exact place in the great chain of being were anything but clear and thus raised a series of uh, doubts. Uh, well, yes, okay. One of the more important authors who mentioned the iguana and one of the earliest chroniclers of South America <clears throat> is Gonzalo Fernandez de Oviedo, who repeatedly brings the iguana up in his Historia Natural y General de las Indias. Oviedo clearly struggled with what amounts to a classificatory problem, that he was on the horns of a dilemma uh, 
becomes apparent in the opinions expressed in the different versions he published and that undergo a significant evolution. In the first edition of the Historia 1535, he places this lizard in the book dedicated to aquatic animals, book 13, chapter two, while in the 1542 edition, he moves it to the book dedicated to animalis, that is land-based quadrupeds, book, tw uh, book 12, chapter seven. He explains this change of mind by saying, I quote, there are many people who do not know how to determine whether this animal is flesh or fish. And as a neutral thing, neutral he uses the word, uh, they, they attribute it to one, of the other, one or the other kind. As a consequence, he asserts that this supposed neutral nature is confirmed by the iguana being, and I quote again, an animal of the earth or one of water, and in each one of these elements, it moves and pursues its life. Far from being a spurious question, the decision of the way to classify this foodstuff had a specific purpose uh, in Catholic lands, where the observance of Lent was a serious matter. Even though Oviedo asserts that according to the opinion of many, it could belong to both elements, earth and water, he points out that some people consume the meat of iguana during Lent. Its neutral status made it eligible as Lenten food. This odd verdict also was also sustained in a very official way by at least two different 17th century high-ranking Spanish ecclesiastics who discussed the matter in great detail. Although it's not possible to go into these authoritative theological opinions, let me briefly conclude by saying that this classificatory problem lays bare the difficulties of fitting new plants and animals into inherited paradigms. Classifying the iguana was the problem both natural philosophers and theologians encountered. To begin, uh, this, however, is not something somehow unknown to the, um, in this period. Uh, since in, in Europe, too, they had similar problems that they dealt with. To begin with, there were frogs, and I'll ask you for the next slide, where, that were also considered a Lenten food. And once again, the Latin binomial, as you can see, Pelophilax esculentus, uh, the binomial indicates their use as a foodstuff. Secondly, and more interestingly, there's the case of the beaver. Next slide, please. Uh, this rodent was also considered Lenten food in much of Northern Europe during the Middle Ages and into the early modern period. But in this case, and next slide, please, only the hairless tail of the animal was admissible, being its most aquatic, scaly, and fish-like feature. Thank you. Uh, I conclude here, and I'm going to ask you to post the last slide, which I will not comment unless we pick it up in the question session. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. We move from the iconic foods to the more rare. And I welcome Gregorio. Hi, thank you very much. Well, I, I also thank the organizers. Mm, Jesuits installed in the New Kingdom of Granada at the beginning of 17th century. First slide, please. The New Kingdom of Granada is more or less actual Colombia. Well, um, a lot more, more. And one of their main tasks was to pursue indigenous idolatry, especially among the Muisca people, an indigenous group that lived in the Altiplano Cundiboyacense, high plateau located in the eastern mountain chain of the Colombian Andes, around the cities of Santa Fe, of Bogota, and Tunja. Next slide, please. 
this, no, the, the previous one, sorry. This is the place. The red points are Bogotá and Tunja and, and all around is the Muisca region. Um, they used to have a political and economic organization more complex than the other groups of the New Kingdom of Granada. In this talk, I will focus on Jesuit strategies pursuing idolatry linked to the agricultural work and drunkenness. Borracheras, in both cases, maize played a key role because it was the main farming and the liquor they drank. Chicha was made of maize. It is important to remember that chicha was a stimulant as well as a kind of liquid bread that provided the highest carbohydrate intake in indigenous diets. Although chicha was more fermented for celebrations, it was still a food that expressed the idea of abundance and festivity. The first strategy consisted in going to the village with food to share with the elderly and the sick. Some on their deathbeds abandoned to their fate. The Jesuits and the bread they offered was their only solace. Once they were given food, the process of catechization and confession began. In exchange for nourishment, the native would disclose their most precious secrets. The Jesuits searched for place of worship as well as idols and offerings. Next slide, please. Oh, this is chicha, the chicha they were drinking in the borracheras. And the next slide are more or less like the idols they have, the, the, they were looking for. This is tragedy made historical sense. At the beginning of the 17th century, the elderly became the guardians of beliefs and sanctuaries because the traditional religious figures that had gone through extensive training were removed for Spaniards. According to Jesuit's report, the Muiscas had gods for different activities and situations. With the pressure of evangelization, the old cult became secret. As vigilance increased, the urban and domestic altars disappeared in favor of those located in the maize fields. These locations were safe, more or less, because the natives were farthest from the observation of the Spaniards in the countryside. And in addition, altars were located in secret locations that could be found only by the initiated. There were not enough Jesuits, not even enough Spaniards to cover all of the maize fields and they would not be able to locate by themselves where the idols were hidden. That's why it was so important to have the confessions of the elders as some revealed the places of worship and idolatry. The search and destruction of idols were fundamental tasks for the Jesuits. However, they also realized that the natives had other pagan practices that did not revolve exclusively around God's representation, such as indigenous drunkenness. The ritualized consumption of alcoholic beverage in Latin America has been widely studied by Claudio Ferlan, Alexandre Varela, and Santiago Muñoz. I will only add that in the New Kingdom of Granada, festivities where drunkenness took place were celebrated mainly around the maize harvest season. One strategy was to focus on a specific dates of the year to avoid drunkenness on those days during Corpus Christi, Immaculate Conception, and St. Ignatius Day. Jesuits gather the natives and preach, them, preach to them about spiritual mothers. Priests could observe the natives' behavior and at the same time, they transformed the time of collective drinking into time for religious reflection, converting sacred pagan joy into spiritual circumspection and excess into moderation. This strategy echoed those used by the same Jesuits against carnival manifestations in the Spanish cities where Society of Jesus colonized festivities through preaching and calling for repentance and confessions. The selection of the dates, Corpus Christi, Immaculate Conception, and San Ignatius Day had a high importance for the Jesuit and for the Catholic Reformation. They were also significant from an indigenous perspective as they all came about in the months of June and July when natives had important festivities where drunkenness took place. In this way, Jesuits occupied and conquered the time of indigenous celebration. Of course, Muscat could move such dates, 
but festivities then lost their significance as sacred celebrations, especially because the change depended on decisions made by the clergy. Since Jesuits were aware that the times for drunkenness could move, they took further steps to strip this practice of its sacred content. In towns, they were especially vigilant of parties, forcing natives to ask for permission for any big celebration. If a party took place without a license, Jesuits would enter and spill all the maize liquor on the ground. If the party was allowed, Jesuits visit the place to verify that there, were, there was no trace of pagan celebration and that natives were celebrating what was authorized, a baptist, a wedding, a day for the brotherhood, a house inauguration. Jesuits tame the indigenous drunkenness, discarding its sacred content and turning parties into lay mothers or even Catholic celebrations. Jesuits celebrated that in Fontibon town, I quote, drunkenness does not occur as before. Today, when someone gets married, they come together to eat and drink as the Spaniards do, drinking in moderation. In my opinion, this was not actually the case at all. Rather, it is evidence pointing to the program of Christianization practiced and projected by the Society of Jesus, according to which native would ideally behave like Spaniards. To conclude this process of transformation of indigenous customs, at least with regard to drunkenness, the Jesuits identified that a performative pedagogy was necessary because according to them, the subaltern groups were moved more by form than by content. They insisted on the mechanics of exterior applause because without it, I quote, indigenous and Africans do not live properly. Jesuits organized a theatrical performance during mass using trumpets, show music, and gunfire. In the midst of all these sounds, an angel brought down three images representing drunkenness, dishonesty, and idolatry. This educational spectacle showed that Christianization would defeat the hidden practices of the natives, especially this imputed trinity. In their desacralization of the idolatrous practice of Muisca people, Jesuits pursued idols in the fields so that the crops were no longer under the protection of native gods. They occupied the dates of the indigenous festivals to turn them into just another celebration. They kept close watch over drunkenness so that the natives could only celebrate what was allowed. They moderate excessive drinking, which in itself was sacred to the indigenous people, turning it into an acceptable consumption according to the ideal Hispanic patterns. Little by little, they removed everything that the indigenous people considered sacred from the fields and festivals and substituted it with Western content. While the structures of the past were maintained, and in fact, indigenous people continued cultivating their fields and drinking their chicha, everything was now different. This practice slowly became profane, no longer linked to the old order, but to a new one in which the Muiscas were part of a subaltern group with their practices, beliefs, and desires regulated by the Society of Jesus. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gregorio. Thank you, Davide. Thank you, Alan, for this wonderful panel. I'm going to do a stop share and welcome you all to turn your video on so we can ask some questions. As, we, as I mentioned, those of you in the audience, please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box. Panelists can put their questions in the chat for us to check out. These were great papers. Okay, while we're gathering our questions together, uh, I'll just start off by asking you a little, you each to speak a little bit more about the motivations behind some of these texts. I mean, from Gregorio, it's clear the Jesuits are interested in conversion. Um, Davide, you spoke a little, and both Davide and Alan spoke a little bit about proto-ethnographic interests. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit more behind the politics of writing about food in these texts and what we can learn from them. Uh... If I can go in, in my case, or, or, or better say the case of the text I was commenting, uh, an interesting aspect is that uh, this, this chain of, of information 
intersected with uh, missional discourses. So uh, the Relazione of the Anonymous Conqueror and uh, even more clearly the Descrizione dell'India Occidentale also drew from works of missionaries like Bartolomé de las Casas and other Dominican missionaries whose aim was basically to, uh, to show that indigenous people, once uh, uh, that their idolatry had been destroyed, uh, actually they were very civilized people. So these paragraphs describe in very positive terms their ways of dressing, for example, garments are all often associated with food uh, that they used to eat and, and um, let's say good food. And it's, um, uh, it's interesting to, to notice that uh, agave wine, Octley, in these sources is described as part of a wider description of agave as a marvelous plant with lots of uses. And it still not have that hue of drunkenness, which it, it links with what Gregorio was saying, that will, will, um, will be much more important later on. The drunkenness of a pulque drinker will become kind of, of the, the bad mark of Indian behavior. But in this space, it's still part of a description of an Indian civilization uh, as, a, as a highly civilized one, uh, and it, it is part of the transformative colonial project of Dominican mission. You know, they are civilized, they're human, they're rational, so that they can become as us. So in some way they're describing, describing these food habits with this sense, with these ideas in mind. Alan or Gregorio, did you have anything to add? <coughs> well, uh, in my case, uh, it, I was working with uh, the annual letters that Jesuits wrote. It's a wonderful document, and a wonderful text. And they insist very much in the ethnographic aspect of knowing indigenous lives um, in a way of transforming. And, and the political insight or, or the political aim is, well, with Jesuits it's always complicated, but it's, it's very, at least I think it's very clear that they are trying to justify why they have to be in the new kingdom of Granada as, they were one of the last orders entering in the new kingdom of Granada, but they insist it's very important they are there because the previous work done by the um, diocesan or the secular uh, the priest and the other orders was not that perfect as they can do it. So I must admit the, the detail they can give about the indigenous life it's amazing I mean they say more or less what the others were saying but the detail is something incredible so I think this uh, is a way of justifying why they should be there and why they should uh, expand in all the cities of the new kingdom more or less that's what I think so we have several great questions here from the audience already, but Alan has a question for Gregorio. Would you like to ask yourself, Alan? Could, it, could I just jump in on the, on, yeah. the, on your question, which I think is an interesting one. And, that, and I just want to say that it, it used to be said in the 70s and the 80s that ideology is what other people have. It's not what you have. And, uh, and that's a little bit the, 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 the problem here is that uh, classifying sounds like a, a, a basically an anodyne, uh, non-ideological uh, exercise. Well, it isn't. And, and you see that in particularly well in the medieval and uh, in the re Renaissance way of classifying where in fact it is a fundamental political and ideological uh, exercise of, uh, but it'd be too complicated to explain where it comes from and, and where it's going. But it, just to say that if you're looking at, at these classifications, you're actually looking at pure ideology, even though it's not that obvious. 
And if I can add something, I think it's important to stress that ideology or, or let's say epistemological framework work at different levels. In, in the case I commented, for example, as I was, as I was just saying, uh, the fact that the descriptions of indigenous food are uh, basically positive, it doesn't mean that the uh, literary genre they are constructing this out of time description of indigenous communities located in a typological time, out of history, is inherently colonial. Huh? So even if at first sight it could seem uh, yeah, a, a friendly and nice description of indigenous people, actually the, the very uh, structure of those texts is kind of putting them in a chronological cage, which is one of the basic tenets of, of colonialism. So you can see ideology working at different levels. And I think that our analysis must consider this complexity of texts. Yeah, certainly we have to think about the motivation, the, all the, the, the politics behind these, the production of these sources. Alan, do you wanna go ahead and ask your question to Gregorio? Yeah, Gregorio, my, my question was, um, to what extent is the, the, the Jesuit policy on drinking actually an, ex, an explicitly stated objective and, or is it implicitly uh, uh, something that, that you're deriving from the evidence that you have? I'm just wondering, and if it is explicit, what kind of sources are there to, to try to understand that? Well, I would say it, and, and it's not a very good answer, but it's more or less implicit in some times and explicit somehow. I mean, for example, when they are doing the thing with the, the, the mass celebration with the music and all those, it's pretty explicit. But in, in other times, it's like they are trying to, um, and for all indigenous life, to uh, achieve that medium point that is so important in Jesuit preach, and uh, but um, but they also know or, or wrote, but not only Jesuits, all the Spaniards that indigenous, uh, at least in the New Kingdom of Granada, but I think it's extensible to all the New World, is the indigenous are very uh, moderate in all the things, uh, I mean, in eating, but not in drinking. The only excess is drinking. So it's their main effort because, I mean, the other things, their, the bed or the clothes or mm, the incomes or the wealth is not a, uh, a problem for the indigenous life, but the drinking is. So it's sometimes you can be, you can realize it's very explicit, but in other times it's very explicit. And the sources, well, uh, I, I will ask you for one year to give you a good answer. Sorry about that. We have several questions here for Davide, some of them interrelated. Um, from Deanna Danforth, Dave, she writes, Davide outlined hypotheses of the genealogy of ideas through printed texts, but could other types of permission transmission also have been involved? I think she must be thinking about manuscripts, which you also brought in. And I know your work in the past has dealt a lot with objects and goods coming from the Americas. So perhaps you could talk about that. And then Liz Horadovich writes in, you know, great papers. Davide, hey, can, you, <laughs> can you tell us about this Venetian manuscript? We're all curious about that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so the first question about other types of transmission. Uh, obviously, manuscripts were circulating. Some of them, well, with the very different degrees of circulation. For example, it is clear that uh, Bartolome de las Casas' Ap Apologetica Historia must have circulated in a manuscript form much before its printing, because it's cited by many authors before the the printing of, of the work. So manuscript uh, obviously had an important role. Um, I uh, suppose 
that um, direct information by missionaries and soldiers coming back to Europe was also important. For example, in those texts about material culture that, that Leah was mentioning, I, I've been working on in the, in the description, it is clear that the author also spoke with the missionary who brought objects because uh, it, it, uh, he, repeat, he recorded information that was not recorded in coeval text. And regarding food, also the habits of Europeans coming back from the Americas to Europe because they, they got used to indigenous ways of, of preparing food. Uh, we were used to, to repeat, uh, uh, too much repeat the story that uh, indigenous food were inserted into European um, food systems as naked food, let's say, deprived of, of the knowledge of the practices, indigenous practices, but actually uh, more recently we are understanding, for example, in, in the case of cacao, the Marcy Norton works uh, clearly show that in Spain, Europeans were drinking cacao, at least in the 16th century, in a way that was basically the indigenous one, with flowers, with lots of, of flavors and textures, um, that are obviously uh, drawn from the indigenous world. So I would say, yes, books, uh, oral um, uh, information, manuscripts, and practice uh, for what it uh, regards uh, food. And uh, okay, the Venetian manuscript. Uh, I'm working on this. Uh, uh, I found, uh, well, I, I, I'm not the first one to, to recognize the existence, or it was briefly mentioned in an ancient work, uh, in Venice there is a copy of, of the so-called Codex Vaticanus A, Codex Vaticano Latino. You're breaking up a little bit, Davide. Sorry? You're breaking up a little bit. Ah, oh, so, oh sorry. So in Venice there is a manuscript copy of the so-called Codex Vaticanus A, uh, and uh, uh, to me, it is very interesting because it contains some errors uh, which are repeated in the text of the Descrizione dell'India Occidentale, which in my opinion was written and published in Venice. So obviously that manuscript is the missing link between the Codex Vaticanus Latinus, which is still today in, in the Vatican Library in Rome, and the text published in Venice. Uh, I was wondering why there were differences, in tiny differences in the information recorded in, in Codex Vaticanus A and the Descrizione. And now that I found this intermediate manuscript, I kind of, of recognize the reasons of the differences. So uh, obviously someone from Venice went to Rome, copied the text of Codex Vaticanus A, sometimes making errors, especially when writing Nahuatl terms uh, and uh, brought it to Venice where someone else used it as a source for his, uh, for his uh, book. Super interesting. Looking forward to talking to you more about that. <laughs> Gregorio, there's so many questions here about um, chicha. So I will try to get them to you. There's some many interrelated. Um, an anonymous attendee asks if the Jesuits say anything about the production of it. He writes, I'm curious about the levels of observation, surveillance at play here and how deep the Jesuits interrogations went. Also, can you share the names of the authors you mentioned who have published on the ritual drinking? And Victoria Yeoman asks, um, she was wondering if Gregorio could say more about chicha and how it was made. Do different kinds of maize make different kinds of drinks? And then Rene Girard asks, is there a similar approach towards smoking habits? So that's a lot of questions. You can sort of choose what you like from there. Well, um, thanks for the questions. I, the, the, there is also a concern about the tobacco more than the smoking in itself. And tobacco and coca that in the New Kingdom of Granada, the general name was Aju or Haju. And, and it was, usually consumed together, tobacco and coca, in order to produce uh, halluc well, hallucination is maybe too strong, but with, let's say uh, 
excitation. Excitation, thank you, Alan. And, and it, it appears in the preoccupations of the Jesuits about uh, forbidden these practices. I mean, tobacco and coca, but more together that separated. Because separated was not that uh, um, a, a war, because in fact, there is a, um, a letter, but not a, an annual letter, but a, a simple letter that Jesuits uh, established a strategy to what we could call a pr proletarization of the coca. I mean, just for working. And they say to the woman, well, you can, um, you can chew coca after receiving um, the corpus of the, the, the communion because God is so strong that nothing matters and nothing alters his, his potency. I, I don't remember the exact words, but more or less, I mean, what I try to say is the, the, the preoccupation of the tobacco and coca was when they were together, not separated. And with the shicha, well, the shicha, uh, the traditional way of doing is chewing, mainly by women, uh, chewing the corn and spit it on, on pots. And the fermentation is thanks to the, uh, uh, well, uh, sorry. Uh, in Spanish is the las enzimas, but I don't know how to say that in English. But anyway, it's it's a process. It, it could with the arrival of the Spaniards, possibly it was transformed the chewing, but with the hot water, and with the popularization of the sugar, and and the honey sugar, uh, it would replace and the chewing and become and this made a change because chicha go sweeter than in the past that it's pretty interesting so for example a, a dominican no sorry a franciscan like fray pedro simon he used to say that the spanish used to make the chicha cleaner than the indigenous and this is very interesting I didn't say it here because it's an, a Franciscan and I was working about Jesuits, but it's, it shows that indigenous and Spaniards were doing chich, but they were doing different. I think they were doing the same, but who am I to discuss with uh, Fray Pedro Simon? So, but the problem it was an, an ideological problem of what was done. Um, and Yes, different kind of corn produce different kind of beverage according to the amount of, I think the word is almidon. Sorry about that. And um, but the the main difference, at least in the New Kingdom of Granada, is they started to uh, add sugar or not sugar. Finally, uh, I, uh, Jesuits did not say a lot of the production of chicha. And it, that's interesting because uh, maybe, maybe this is just an hypothesis, uh, as all the previous proto-ethnographs have talked so much about the chicha, maybe they thought that was not that interesting. Um, they, they speak more about the, you know, they, they wrote more, more about the, uh, rituals around the chicha and, 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 and how the women were still important in order to make the chicha, but not for the chewing, but for all the other work around. And finally, the names are uh, Claudio Ferlan, an Italian researcher. And he just published a book, Alain recommended, Sborni Sacre, Sborni Profani. And the other guy is Santiago Munoz, is a Colombian researcher who made a book very interesting, but the name is not that interesting, but the book is very interesting, is um, Costumbres en Disputa, like costumes in dispute, more or less. It's, it's like a link, a link to Thompson, but I 
not sure if it worked that well. And the last one is Alexandre Varela. Varela. Uh, it's an, uh, a Brazilian researcher, a pretty nice guy. Uh, and, and he made a, also a book about drunkenness in the new war. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Gregorio. So we really should be wrapping up soon. I, we have a ton more of other questions we might have to try to answer via email later. But for Alan, I just have, people have a lot of questions still about the iguana. So perhaps you could talk for just two more minutes and then we'll give everybody a break. Um, Danielle Alessi writes, thank you, Alan, for the fascinating talk. Can you speak a little bit more on the shifts for animals as appropriate or inappropriate for Lent? foods during Lent. You touched on the beaver at the end, noting eventually only its tail could be eaten during Lent. Can you offer some of the reasons for these shifts and other examples of American animals evolving on this scale? And then Madeline Bassett asks, I'm interested in the question of assimilation, especially in relation to the iguana. Alan, do you see an effort to assimilate this indigenous food in the attempt to categorize it for Lent? Does the term assimilation apply here? I should also note that since we don't have much time, we all we could stay on a little bit later after the next panel to discuss further. I invite all the panelists to stick around and anybody who's interested in talking more about the papers. But Alan, if you have can wrap up in about two minutes. Yeah, but it's not easy. I'll try. <laughs> but because obviously I was working on the whole classificatory system from the Middle Ages and so on. And basically, the, 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 where it becomes interesting is at the confluence of, of two, two different uh, um, elements. And there, that's exactly in that area there that all kinds of curious things happen. But they're curious not for an anecdotal reason, but rather because they show that, in fact, there's an effort that's being made to try to keep the system uh, working, even though reality is always more complicated, so it's difficult to, to make it work. So there's not really a shift. It's just simply that when you discuss the, the, the great chain of being, uh, then uh, you have to somehow decide where an, an animal or a plant uh, has to be placed, and that's the problem. So uh, there, there are no shifts. It, uh, it's just a discussion that's going on. So it's not as if in the 16th century they're saying something different than in the 15th. It's actually remarkably similar. I don't know if that's an, a good answer, but that's the best I can do with two minutes. <laughs> Okay, great. Well, let's just conclude this panel for today. Thank you so much. This were wonderful papers. Great discussion. As I mentioned, if you could stick around after the next panel, that'd be great. We could discuss further. So now we'll take a brief two minute, three minute pause. You might start a few minutes late and uh, Neha will change her, put up the next round of PowerPoints and we'll get ready for this session related the the round table devoted to race and food in early modern in the early modern book.